Let's try and say something at the same time. Ready? Three, two, one. Bananas. Wow. Mm. Says a lot about me and you, doesn't it? It it does, really. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Hello and welcome to In The Pocket. My name's Johnny. And my name's Chris. Two totally average bass players and we're here to talk all about that bass. As well as answering your questions at home, each week we take a look at the latest news, maybe break down some tones, or to give you the lowdown on the low end. Welcome. Um, I want to say something um, up top to everybody listening to this right now. Uh-oh. Uh, and sincerely apologize. Um, I don't know if you saw our statement that we put out on, on social media. Yeah. Um, that the last episode was episode 69 and we failed to make any jokes around this. Uh, so maybe this needs to be episode 69 instead. We'll just this name it. Episode 69 again. Yeah. I guess this time it's personal. <laughs> 69 two. 69 in... with a vengeance. With vengeance. That's the one I was looking for. <laughs> I was yeah. honestly mortified when you, in, when you informed me of the, colossal balls up that uh, we'd missed this monumental milestone yeah. i was genuinely devastated like we'll never get that again never that that's moment that's a painful thing should we start unless, a new unless, podcast yeah and just have another go just do like 68 episodes of filler and then just start yeah. again or we could would we get away with it if we went back and like deleted two episodes so Ooh, then we can no. we can go back in and go. Oh look, it's episode sixty nine. Yeah, well, we'll just start from when we started with you on here. You know? Oh, but then it... but you'd already done about twenty on your own. <laughs> yeah, I know. So we'll we'll go back. Oh, we'll go back. Okay. We'll delete those, get rid of them. Okay, uh, and then we'll just go on from there. <laughs> well, it's worth noting though we do two a month, so that's twenty four a year. That doesn't sound like a lot, does it? No, it really. What what have we been doing? <laughs> We like, Live it. This is our best lives. It's like I I feel like we crank out like two a week. It feel it feels like that. It yeah. feels like we're like nonstop, and then like, we oh, look, God, then it's... you look back and go, we literally just do this like every two weeks. Sit on the phone and chat, and that's it. God, that is awful. Grip. Yeah, exactly. Maybe um, we should find some way to facilitate a third episode a month, but make it a way where oh maybe. Mm, what about behind a paywall? That oh, would be that would interesting, be, wouldn't it? Mm. That'd be excellent. I would yeah. love that. Yeah, I, I more would on love that. To pay for that. Yeah, more on that. Yeah, at, at a well, later date. Yes, for sure. What have you been up to, um, Johnny? I believe uh, you you had a gig and had an altercation on the way to said gig. Yes, I did. <laughs> I had a gig. It was in the car accident on the way. It was brilliant. Oh my god. Uh, well, it, I, dramatizing it a little bit. We had a little shunt, shall we say. Uh, all the gear was in the back and we had to do an emergency stop because some people braked hard in front of us. We were like, oh, bloody hell. And we skidded a little bit, came to a stop. We were like, oh, thank God for that. Bang! <laughs> Someone went out the back of us. We were like, no! Oh, uh, so, been there. I've had that yeah. happen to me. It hurts, doesn't it? Yeah, well, we, look, we were in a big transporter. So we didn't. Oh, okay. It wasn't that bad, really, but you definitely felt it. And uh, yeah, I was thinking, oh, no, my cab. <laughs> it's right in the back yeah. but it all survived oh well satisfied. that's a relief the the bumper of um the car that bumped into us not so much uh, no their, Toy- their toyota logo was snapped in half but you know was it just nothing- a case of just a case of the person in front slammed on and then the person behind you just wasn't paying enough attention or were they right up your bump well uh both it's a great place probably. to be yes yes everybody is always straight out my bum that's why i invite them to be um yeah they they were brown nosing us uh big time i classic I classic great teacup by the way thank you isn't it x it's got little legs look at it wow um i've Fantastic. just got a plain i've just got a plain white one for those of you uh for those of you just listening to the podcast oh. um go fuck yourself because uh this um <laughs> This was really hard work getting it set up on video, um, but <laughs> I'm sorry. If you just listen to this, that's okay. I, I don't watch any podcasts. I listen to all my podcasts. So still, though, if you would, if maybe 
maybe is like an apology for the fact that you've chose to consume this content in a way that we've provided you, but in a way that is uh, not including a visual medium. Mm. Maybe just go and subscribe to the YouTube channel and drop uh, drop a video of your choosing a like. Yeah. Helps us out a lot, and uh, the bigger the podcast gets, the bigger the guests. Absolutely. And uh, the happier we will be. Right now, we're in the guts, the emotional guts. <coughs> so help us out. Thank Absolutely, you. because my self-worth is sorely determined by the number that is next to my name. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, mm. So if you can do that, and also go over to Instagram and follow us at In the Pocket Pod, where you can ask questions like the lovely people have today. Before we jump into that, though, um, yes, I had a gig this week, mm. uh, but I want to talk to you, Chris, about your couple of weeks. So you've been a busy boy playing gigs, going to lots of gigs as well. Um, I have. And so I want to know what... <laughs> What have you seen with those beautiful, beautiful eyes uh, these past two weeks? These beautiful eyes that I'm now trying to cross my eyes. There we go. Mm, beautiful. Mm. Um, well, I've played a lot of gigs. Um, it's wedding season, so I'm I'm out and about. I'm doing about two to three a week pretty consistently. <coughs> Excuse me. But also, I've been to... I've been to some gigs as a uh, as a spectator, and uh, I was at Download the other week. Drownload, nice. Drownload, Downpour Festival. You're oh my god! You're telling me it's the <laughs> that worst looks bad. It's the worst rain I've not just been in, seen ever. The like the worst rain. Like I feel bad for like Baby Metal because they had. Uh, they got pulled off stage for half an hour. Like, it rained that bad. They had to, like, s- just completely stop the festival and put these, like, emergency signs yeah. up on all the screens saying, like, God, please just stay where you are for the next 30 minutes while we check everything's okay. Because it was, it was bad. It was really... It was some impressive weather. And then on the Sunday was the only day it didn't rain. But because it didn't rain and it was nice and warm, all the mud just turned into glue. Oh. And it was like like... I ended up just not going to the second stage and just watching all the main stage bands because just walking up the hill was just impossible. It was I did it once on the Friday because I really wanted to see Seaton Queen, but she doesn't have a bass player, so we're not talking about her. She's not allowed. She's Das is forbidden. Um I did it once and then came back down and thought, I'm not I'm not I'm just not doing that again. But that was it's just too much work. I like but to yes. think you could just stand at the top of the hill and slide down. <coughs> down yeah, the exactly. Wee. I that think is. some people did do that. On their stomachs, probably. No probably, festivals. yeah. And uh, wow. enjoy that coughing, dear listener. I do apologise for that. Oh, yeah. Um, Your coughing and my sniffing. Yeah, it's going to um, be a nice ASMR-rich uh, ASMR rich uh, episode. But anyway, I was a download, and I went to see Green Day last week. So, mm. I have... A lot of bases to talk about. Where to start? Where to start? start? Let's start with download, shall we? (coughs) Oh, excuse me. So, I'll start with download. In no particular order, I'm going to run through a few bases that sort of stood out for me as like a kind of, oh, they sounded nice and looked nice. Because some people... Very bass heavy guitar mix, and I really enjoyed it. Excellent. The first two, indeed, were good old Mikey Shoes from Queens of the Stone Age. They were headlining the Friday, and they had an excellent front of house mix. Very, very good from where I was standing. Mm-hmm. This is this is not new information. Mikey Shoes was rocking that super cool gold Fender jazz bass. He had uh, a Justin Justin Mendel Johnson Mustang for a few things. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, he did that for... They played um, The Lost Art of Keeping a Secret and Make It With You, and he played a short scale for both of them. Oh, wow. Just, Don't really know it, why, but... Yeah, they're it, not like... It wasn't like flats and, like, fingers. <laughs> no, was it? no, no, no. I don't think so. Um, it was a... It was the, the JMJ Mustang, the sort of light blue one in, like, a mm. heavy relic. But yeah, there was no difference in the other songs. It was still like loads of fuzz and stuff like that. I don't know. Maybe they just wanted a bit more of a bit of a less Toby. trebly sound, just a bit more thumpy kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, sounded great. 
tons of different like i could hear the different drives and different fuzzes that were going on like there were some songs where it's like for like shorter parts he, he, he had this like really sort of like spitty fuzz pedal which was really you know like when fuzz pedals they go like they're like really gnarly and you can hear them like choking up while you're playing almost like there's yeah. a gate inside the fuzz uh-huh. pedal there was that and then there was just like that big rich fat bass tone and then there was things that just sounded like a really annoyed bass amp like it was just it was great there was some a really great selection of like bass tones that i could hear really well so that was what's really an, exciting what's an annoyed bass amp sound like me <laughs> well just like it was just like real like, almost like a really pushed guitar amp even sure. like it's not like you know with an svt when you crank the drive on an svt i don't consider that to be a particularly appeasing overdrive like appealing no. overdrive does Agreed. nothing for me but this was almost like I don't know, maybe it was like um, blended with another amp that, you know, they'd, they'd EQ'd or gone to some sort of guitar amp maybe and pushed that alongside a bass amp or just like a nice a nice pedal. But either way, great, great bass sounds. Great bass nice. sounds. Similar, short-scale territory, the Friday was the first time I ever saw Royal Blood live. Oh, really? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, Did oh my. Sound- did that sound fairly pleasant? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> it was a um, it was just a, a wall. It was a wall. They had a great mix as well. They were on before Queens of the Stone Age. Um they came on and off uh twice actually. They the, Mike Kerr twice um went off stage for about 2 3 minutes then came back on and sort of apologized to the audience saying he's having like some sort of technical problem. Didn't explain mm. what it was. It sounded great out front. I think like his in ears were like playing up or something like that because he said something like, "The second time he was like, sorry guys, sometimes it all goes according to plan. Sometimes it doesn't. We just need to make sure this is right for you, um, so I can play the show that you guys expect. We're just gonna come off and come back on again in a couple of minutes." And yeah. they walked off and came back on again. I'm guessing it was something like he just couldn't hear anything. Couldn't hear anything. Yeah, and but just um, going blind. Yeah. But out the front, though, great tone. He was mainly playing that that Jaguar, that signature Jaguar that we tried at the Fender Showroom, mm-hmm. um, which got very aggressively mixed reviews. But when maybe we just got lucky, maybe uh, the one we played sounded great, felt great, looked yeah. great. I, I kind of so. want, I kind of want one now after watching it. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, Damn. And also, though. Mm-hmm. A lot of the set, I'd say like 50 50, he was bringing on that Gretsch Electromatic, that black one. I saw Just that like in a couple of 300 quid. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. I guess, uh, and that's what I kind of like about some artists. And they're just like, yeah, sounds good. This is fine. The ma- majority of the meat of this sound is coming from the rest of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a 300 quid base into thousands of pounds of switching equipment various amps several cabs like it's yeah. not like a oh yeah man it's just a 300 quid gretsch electromatic it's, into a secondhand sans amp it's all he could afford you know yeah exactly the the the, the 400 like fender basements just like blew his budget so just like <laughs> oh I've spent so much money on like phase cancellation now like, damn <laughs> exactly gonna and get a uh a uke p base <laughs> exactly oh do want one not gonna lie um I'll move on to something a little bit different. The best band of the weekend. Oh. Not the weekend. The best band of the weekend. <laughs> By a country mile, I might add, was Limp Biscuit. Uh, I thought you were going to say Bowling for Soup for some reason. <laughs> uh, no, but you're about to find out why they were second place. But um, oh. Limp Biscuit were insane. Like, I- I've seen them before, but quite a few years ago. Like, they were. They were another level. They were the, mm. the last band on before Avenged Sevenfold on the Sunday. And, like, they could have easily easily headlined. It was I was going to say, that I'm surprised they didn't, in a way. <laughs> I think ne- next time... Well, Andy Copping, who's the head of Downloaders, said, next time Limp Bizkit come back, they'll be headlining. Mm. They were amazing. Like, it was just pure bangers. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why it was pure bangers. They came on to no intro music... Fred Durst literally just said, tonight we're going to party like it's 1999. And they immediately went into break stuff. Wow. Opened the set with break stuff. Then they played like um, Hot Dog, um, 
they, this is not in, not in order. They did Nookie. They did My Generation. They did Take a Look Around. Uh, they introduced Take a Look Around as Let's Play That Weird Song Tom Cruise Likes. Then <laughs> then they did uh, they did Behind Blue Eyes, that acoustic Who cover they do, which is amazing, like proper, properly brilliant. They did the George Michael cover the, the, of Faith. That was amazing too. And then... <clears throat> Then they played Take a Look Around, and then they were sort of like ringing out, and then um, Fred Durst said something like, like, one is bigger than two, and more is more, and then just played Break Stuff again. <laughs> again! And ended, <laughs> with, ended with Break Stuff. But Brilliant. honestly, honestly, like, when they started, and Wes Ball and just went, dun dun everyone went mental. Yeah. And then when he did it the second time... Everyone was just like, "Yes, come on!" <laughs> like screaming, like it was. That, what it move. was amazing. It was Incredible. amazing. And uh, the reason why I bring it up is Sam Rivers, the bass player of the Limp Biscuit, whole set, tobacco burst, Fender five string jazz. Tobacco it sounded great. Sexy. He gets. I I would put Sam Rivers down as like one of the most underrated bass players. I think mm. Cause I it's because I know with Limp Biscuit. It's like you. It's all about. It's, it's Fred Durst and Wes Boland. Like, yeah. Wes Boland's a genius, and a lot. But like, people don't realize it's like all those crazy riffs that Wes Boland plays. Sam Rivers is playing with his fingers. I yeah. might add. And if you want a real challenge, <laughs> if you want a real challenge, learn the the second verse of "Take a Look Around" by Limbiscuit after the chorus. It goes back into the little chill bit, you know, the da da do, da da do, da da do, do do. It goes into that, but Sam Rivers is going like da 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 like that pace for like a good thirty seconds to a minute, and the guy plays with his fingers, and it's rock solid. That's one of those things. That's hard. You know, people discount pick playing and all this. It's like well. It's because, like, for things like that, you can achieve that so easy. Whereas yeah, easy. Your fingers, you're, you're working yeah. overtime, you know. Yeah. Um, but then that gives it probably a more consistent sound, perhaps, to his fingers. What he's doing yeah. There. And it was, I, it was, it, he's a great bassist. I don't know what kind of rig he uses. I didn't really look into that that much. Um, if I was just it's doing, just, like, a shot in the dark, I imagine it's some sort of, like, what, like, Galleon Kruger kind of deal, or it's not a super drivey bass tone. Yeah, I think it's, it's pretty like, clean. No. Isn't it? No, I've seen a picture. He plays Aguilar stuff. Turbo. I've cream. seen. I've I've seen pictures where he, he's got two big, like maybe like big tone hammers or something yeah. like that. Into and they're well, all white and stuff like that. Whilst we're on a uh, tone hammer, a minute. Um, I when I was at the gig the other day, uh, we went to get a drink at another bar, and there was another yeah. band playing, and they were like a six-piece. Uh, Scar band doing Mint. like norm- normal covers of like oh, other songs. Okay, yeah. I was like, oh, this is fun. Absolutely bugger all watching them. Yeah. No one. And then there was a full tone hammer stack uh, with a uh, six grand fedora base. <laughs> so, like, Scott D- so Scott Divine. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I was like, wow, <laughs> that is I'm not going to lie, kind of wasted on this crowd. Oh, I and- know. It's always the like, it's always like the. The bar slash pub band that one one member or two members will bring just some top shelf gear. Yeah, like I've done I've done gigs where, like I've depped for like wedding bands that I've got a pub gig, and the guitarist just shows up with like a pristine Vox AC30, and he pulls yeah. his pedal board out, and it's like, well, that's minimum. That there's three grand's worth of stuff right yeah. there. I'm not stupid. There's loads of like way huge stuff. There's some like clon clones on there. Yeah, like there's, there's an actual clon. Yeah, well, oh wow, yeah, I've I'd, I'd been mugging him in the car park. Um, that's that's but the you thing, know like, like Cali seventy six compressor, like yeah, loads of Spenny tube drives, like Cali seventy six with a Noble preamp, and like it's the the dream, the the Nashville, uh, bass the Nashville special board, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly boutique. Yes, who else have I, I got on here? Continue. Okay, I will continue. Uh, moving on, bowling for soup. Very good, very very good. Despite having to last minute do the set as a free piece, because oh, really? uh, yeah, Chris Burnley is ill at the moment. He's in. Oh. He's he flew back to America. 
oh, shit. to uh, be treated in hospital there. So apparently he's going to be fine, but it's one of them where it's like they just couldn't do the show. And yeah. Jarrett, the singer, was saying it's the second show in 35 years he's played without him. Wow. Um, so that was a bit sad. But like the crowd did a big cheer for him and all that. But excellent band. Good. Walked on, immediately played Girl All the Bad Guys Want. Straight in. Down, down, there was a nice down, trend, down, by down, the way, at Download this year. Every band, with the exception of one, I'll get to that in a minute, just walked on and opened the set with very minimal intro music and yeah. just went straight into like one of their biggest hits. Nice. Like um, The Offspring opened with Pretty Fly for a White Guy. Uh, Queens of the Stone Age opened with Little Sister. Royal Brilliant. Blood opened with, is it Out, out of the Black? The one that's the bomb. Yeah, that is Out yes. of the Black. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> that one. Yeah. <laughs> they opened with that. And that was well cool because they literally just walked on and just went, boom. Da 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 boom. Da boom. Yeah. Do you think that that was a thing from the organizers? Uh, Due to weather or anything, to be like, well, no, we need to not, I not just mess think, around. No, I think it's just the smart way to play a festival mm-hmm. because it's like it's not your crowd. Well, it might be, but it's like it's a festival. They're there to see like anywhere from like five to twenty bands in one day. Yeah, and respectfully, banger, they don't want exactly respectfully. I don't want to hear like a lot of deep cuts and loads of your new album it's like you've got one hour just just blow my head clean off just like yeah. hit me with your best material yeah get my um, attention announce to everyone we have started you know this one exactly yeah. and there is one band at the end of my list that didn't do that and i i did not enjoy it but anyway oh. um born for soup their bass player is a guy called i think it's pronounced he's called his first name's rob i can pronounce that and then i think it's felicetti okay He's the bass player. A uh, very oh, good bass player, I might add. He was playing, oh. and I could not find the name of this bass to save my life. It was a Music Man Stingray with just one P pickup in it. Hmm. And that's it. I will it. tell you and I can't find the name of it. There was no knobs on the bass. There was an on and off switch. Yes. They, um, they, I watched a Rick Rundown. Uh, of theirs fairly recently that mm. TARDID and uh, goes Link through me. everything you know yeah, yeah we'll do um, and the the guitarist who wasn't there they show yeah. his guitar and he's like yeah this has been the one and only guitar is number one yeah. for the whole time same yeah. guitar I was like that's pretty cool yeah and it's like a Les yeah. Paul isn't it that's all like yeah. covered in stickers or something yeah. yeah it's got like a graffiti type thing on it's cool yeah um, yeah the um, it's just a custom so it's not an actual model. right that, okay. That Stingray. It's just a Stingray. Because he used to play a normal Stingray with a humbucker, but now he's just got a B bass. Just like. Yeah. No nonsense. I've seen. No controls, always on. I've seen Dougie from McFly play one as well. Yeah, me too. So I'm yeah. guessing it's just a. Because cu- I'm not going to lie. I'd have that. I'd yeah, have a music man. It's... I'd have a passive music man with just a P pickup. I'd be yeah. well up for that. If I could have that, the vintage music. Oh, if I could have the vintage one, uh, the vintage yeah. music man style neck, the slightly thinner one. Um, yeah, with... is that is that like the Ray Thirty Four? It's the opposite of the Ray Thirty Four. Opposite Ray Thirty Four is like right. a normal Stingray. Yeah, um, so that's because my my Ray Thirty Four is like this. The neck's like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, whereas the Ray Four that I've got and the Ray Twenty Four CA and uh, a Sterling and a um, and that really uh, fancy the... pants one I tried at Base Bros. They've got the yeah. tiny necks, haven't they? Exactly the specials. Yeah, they've got the slim boys. So I imagine it's that kind of spec, but. Just a passive P bass. Yeah, gotcha. Well, it was great. It sounded great. Nice. Uh, I'm going to power on to a uh, a surprise for me. I uh, Polythia played on the Friday afternoon. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't really listen to Polythia. Um, I've yeah. tried. Every time I've listened to them, I've kind of just gone, it's just a bit too good for me. You know, like, <laughs> it's like, and I grew up on, like, a lot of, like, instrumental stuff. Like, I used to love Steve Vai and Joe Satriani and stuff like that but like i've just never been that bothered by polyphia like i'm not really into kind of like the the, the super clean like the, the 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 natural harmonics the like the flamenco influences stuff like that i've just never really been that bothered but i thought 
I've got the time. I don't remember who they were clashing with, but it was no one I was that bothered by. So I thought, you know what? It was a rare moment where it wasn't raining. So if, and um, the people out the other the people I was there with were doing something else. So I thought, you know, what? I'm gonna I'm gonna sit and watch Plythia. Really impressed. Really impressed. Yeah. Uh, really, really ent- surprisingly entertaining as well. Like they, even though they were playing all this like instrumental stuff, and there was there was a little bit of talking. So the other guitarist that isn't um, oh no, I forgot both of the names. There's Tim Henson, uh, Tim Henson, and, and then and I forgot the name of the other guy, Nick, someone, no. something like that. I'm thinking of Nick Johnston. <laughs> no, not oh, him. No. Um, the other guitarist was doing talking between the songs, and he was great. But, like, they were playing all this stuff and they were, like, running around. They were, like, interacting with the crowd. They were getting the crowd going. Like, they really they really nailed it. And Clay Gober, the bass player, was uh, was quite reserved, by the way. Kind of just chilled with the drum kit the entire time, which I was yeah. I, I thought he'd be running around too, but he was just concentrating, played bass. Bass sounded great. He was rocking a six-string Ibanez, mm-hmm. which I've seen online that it, it's a rumoured signature model that isn't out yet. Got that yeah, right. it's it's yeah. an ATK, isn't it? I think. I think so, but it's yeah, I think so, but it it looks a bit more boutique than an ATK. It had two yeah, pickups. It, it's more this like lovely a, kind of like flamed marble kind of thing. Yeah, that looks insane. Um, Scott LePage, the other guitar player. Oh, okay, he was great too. Um, they were both ridiculously good, but yeah, I really really enjoyed their set and Claire's bass tone was fantastic. And then now mm. I will move swiftly on to. Another Stingray, the second, the second Stingray of download. Oh it God. was Blackstone Sherry. Oh, I wasn't yes. expecting this one. Nice. <laughs> so they have, they they have a new bass player. I think he's been in the band for maybe like a year or two, maybe a little bit longer. It's called Steve Jewell, and he was mm. rocking a um, sort of sea foam green music man, just pretty, pretty standard running it through what I can only describe as a lot of distortion. Like, yeah. a lot. Like, there, it, there was a lot of drive going on, and it sounded great. Mm. It was just Super like, I don't know what, again, I don't know what he was iron. using. Uh, no, not really, actually. Like, not really? trebly, just like crap tons of mid-range and bass. It was almost wow. like... Wow. First I think he way. was... Yeah, I think for a few things, he was using, like, a swollen pickle or something like that. Like there was just this, just this huge fuzz sound that was going on underneath stuff. Like sometimes, like there's a few songs where they take like dual guitar solos where they're both playing lead at the same time, and he what whatever he turned on filled the gap more than fine. Like sounded great. They sounded great. Easily one of the best bands of the the weekend. Now, wow. I'm going to fast forward to Sunday. Sunday morning, second band on the main stage, Creeper. Uh, the lovely bass player is a guy called Sean Scott, and he was using a magnificent black P bass with a taut pit guard, and it sounded Apple neck, rosewood, um, rosewood, of course, lovely, very nice bass, just yeah. this like rock solid driving tone. I don't know what he uses, but it gave off big like, like, sand amp into a stingray. Sorry, sounds I'm into an SVT. Can you imagine? <laughs> wow. Into another bass. Impressive. And then, yeah. <laughs> wow, gain staging. Yeah, into like an SVT. Wasn't like super trebly or super mid rangey. Just kind of like, just like, like that, like bomb proof, like 80s bass. Just like yeah. straight down the middle. Plays with a pick. Lots of like just rock solid eighth notes. Sounded fantastic. Very good. Very nice. Excellent. And they had a really good mix as well. And the last one. Now you may remember, I talked about a band who didn't play the festival game. Like every band yeah. I've just mentioned there, including Creeper. Like Creeper opened with a song called the uh, song called "Cry to Heaven," which is like the big hit off the new album. And it's like the when I saw them on the headline tour, they ended with that song. So it's like again, everyone's playing like they will open with a big hit. It's like. I can't remember. Oh, Blackstone Cherry opened with Me and Mary Jane, which is like obviously, again, one of the big single hits off a previous album. You know, Limp Bizkit rolling, uh, Bowling for Soup, Girl All the Bad Guys Want, you know, uh, Queens of the Stone Age with Little Sister. Avenge Sevenfold. Right. So, Johnny Christ, excellent bass player, 
has a podcast. I recommend it. Quite enjoyable. It's called Drinks with Johnny. <laughs> you should trademark that. Yeah, I was going to um, say. He was playing his... He has a signature Spectre bass, which is just all black. I think it's got two humbuckers in it. If you look online, you can see one that's like a PJ. But the one he was using just had two big slab two big slab humbuckers. They might be dual coils just with a cover or the humbuckers. I'm not too sure. Just like kind of rock solid active bass. Sounded great. Mix was excellent. They didn't play the festival game though. They basically did the headline set if you went to see them at their own yeah. show. Like a lot of stuff off the new album. They played like two new album songs first then a hit, then some more new album, mm -hmm. then a couple of hits, and then I won't lie, they were on for about an hour and 40, I think, in total. They, they lost me 45 minutes in, and I decided yeah. it's the end of the day. I'm going home. I'm yeah. exhausted. I'm so uh, I didn't stay for the full set, which is a shame, really, because like, and then I looked at the set list and realised there was actually a lot of songs that I was secretly hoping they played that they didn't. Um, well, that's, you know, no loss then, really. No, not really. Like they didn't like they didn't play Beast in the Harlot, which is insane in my book. Yeah. But um yeah, great mix, but like this is what I mean. It's like I feel like when you're playing a festival, headliner or not, you can't guarantee that's your crowd. Like no. even um I didn't go I didn't go see them, but Pantera headlined the second stage and uh, a couple of people I know were telling me that they they were playing <laughs> big hits like Walk and um Oh, I forgot the other name of it. They were just playing like a lot of their big hits like at the start. Because it's like you need to just like grab people. Like It's not your crowd. It's a festival. They're there to see several bands over the weekend. It's not a Pantera gig. It's not an Avenged Sevenfold gig. It's not a Limp Bizkit gig. You've well, got Pan to... Pantera haven't played in the UK for like... 20 years. Uh, 20 years, yeah. So, yeah. you know, they have to do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As well. Like, it'd be stupid. But yeah, um, a great... A smorgasbord, an excellent platter of bases, I might add, or the download. Very enjoyable. Um, Just to share about the weather. Yeah, that's right. Um, I know you've been to another gig as well. That sounded wonderful, by the way. And I'm, oh, I'm very jealous that uh, I wasn't there this year. And that was one year ago that we had we met in, I know. in the flesh for the first time. I know. I would have it's rather it, I would rather the weather be like it was last year. Yeah, sweltering. Um, but it was. I mean, maybe I don't know. Maybe five degrees less. Mm. But uh, shade, my, please. Yeah, my my God, that rain was something else. <laughs> um, <laughs> shall I very quickly talk about Green Day? Um, yes, I want to talk about Taylor Swift as well. Okay, how about I've spoken for a long time, so talk to me about Taylor Swift because I completely forgot that you've been to Taylor Swift. <laughs> so did please I. Please do tell. Talking. Oh, so did you? Okay, please um, do tell me more. Yeah, as alluded to last week, um, went to see Amos Heller play live. I mean, Taylor Swift to see uh, to play live. Um, supported by the Almighty with Paramore, an extremely of niche, an extremely niche opening act. Yeah, who? Para what? Para less? Well, I've seen pictures on TikTok, and it's like they're just playing to no one. <laughs> well, what's going on? For our um, shows, it was pretty busy in there, but it, was, it seemed a bit lighter because the sun hadn't really gone down as much. Okay, uh, yeah, had, it was like the roof over. Yeah, yeah, um, and uh, I'll, I'll start with Paramore. Excellent, please do. Uh, you know, lots of different bases on display. We had oh, was there lots? Mm -hmm. We had two. We had two. Um, we had the uh, uh, Joey Quinn, um, the bass player. He had a grabber, which was no Ripper, uh, Gibson Ripper, which looked Ooh. incredible, and that's what he was doing. Um, mm -hmm. A it fun on on the slap bass bit of the bridge of that song. Oof, sounded great. Um, and then was using his kind of bright blue American <laughs> P bass, which also sounded great. Um, I think that was it. I don't think he changed P basses. He didn't bring out the Antigua. That's I was a bit sad about. But there we go. <laughs> not a no no mold burst to be seen. No, Fred not. Um, and then uh, Taylor Swift obviously came on and was insane. Uh, what a show. Oh, my God. Uh, you know, I'm not the biggest fan in the world, um, but I, you know, was very much, <laughs> was very much appreciating um, the stage set up and the choreography and, and everything that went into that whole 
production is incredible. For it's three nuts. Hours. It's nuts, isn't it? Like I saw the film version of the of the tour that you were at, and even I was sat there in the cinema just going, the scale of this yeah. is insane. Like this is yeah. like this is nuts. And um, there's bits where like like the band will walk out and all that stuff's heavily choreographed because then they all yeah. hit their mark, stand in a place, and then the stage lifts up in places and puts people on different <laughs> levels. And that what a feeling that must be. Incredible. Uh, I'd love to get Amos on here to talk about that after seeing that especially because, yeah, really cool. I bet some really interesting but... bits behind the scenes about how they practice that because um, everyone hit their marks incredibly well. Um, Bass-wise, he had like a uh, kind of Daphne Blue-looking P bass um, for some of the heavier stuff. He had his like Sunburst Jazz bass, uh, and he also uh, brought out a uh, Hofner um, viola bass, which is cool for a lot of like the folklore, ever more like um, stuff he's playing with the fingers. Yeah, the more acoustic things, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which sounded sounded great there's some thumpy um and yeah it with that kind of stadium size you might think that the bass could get a bit lost or not so defined perhaps but i could hear it great you know it sounded really good um and yeah very very cool uh i couldn't see anything set up wise anything else he played a lot of um synth bass for yeah he plays a lot of keyboard doesn't he like yeah synth bass and keyboard as well the old dude don't they i've seen i remember on the film like a lot of the guitarists would jump on and play keyboards and then come back around again. Yeah, very and impressive. There's, and th- but there's lots of bits that um, uh, that were play physically played live that could have very easily been on track, you know. But you can tell yeah. it was being played live, which I thought was was great. And they actually rock, yeah. rocked up a lot of the songs quite a bit, you know. I thought, um, yeah, with having guitars and random solos, it was a bit solo heavy in the first couple of songs. <laughs> not gonna lie, and I was like, okay, <laughs> all right, I get it. But well, it I believe, the I believe well. the, I believe the lead guitarist is the MD, so that might be why. <laughs> <laughs> space for improvised solo. Space for improvised solo. Exactly, but no, wow. it, it, I'm very jealous. Um, did did Paramore get a good reception? It's just because, like, what I've seen on TikTok of, like, the videos, I think it might just be, like, the angle, or I don't know whether it's, like, the Liverpool stuff instead of, because you saw them in Cardiff, but, like, the seats, like, while they're on, are yeah. empty. Like, yeah. it looks like they're playing to genuinely nobody it on some videos. It definitely filled out more when they came off stage, but that's just because mm. there's so many people there yeah. to get there. Um, but... To be fair, the Cardiff one was, and Lily was telling me this because she'd seen a lot of uh, <laughs> clips leading up to it as, and was saying the same thing, that Paramore it seemed like not many people. But Cardiff, they had the best showing for, of people okay. so far on the tour by the looks yeah. of it. She was like, wow, there's loads of people here for them. So that was good. They played yeah. Last Hope, which is uh, one of my, probably my top 10 songs. Hey. It's like one of the songs that they switch in and out for each okay. set. And uh, yeah, that was that was very good. Mm-hmm. But, um, so yeah, chuffed. Very. I'm cool. assuming. I'm assuming it was quite a, like a, a the poppy side of Paramore. Like quite. I, I was going to say I can't imagine them going in with like emergency or like. Did they play <laughs> Crush Crush Crush? No, they haven't played Crush 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 for years. Wow, really? To my, to my knowledge, yeah. They on the on every. Have I seen? I don't think I've seen them play that live. I've seen them six times now. I think, and I don't th- think I've seen it. No, because you were at. Were you at when they did headline Redden and Leeds, and they caught headline that with Queens of the Stone Age? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Years ago. They played it then. Oh, well, they did. That was the one I was not sure about um, mm. set wise. Um, yeah, because I remember. Because I remember, like, I don't like. I remember Ailey Williams had bright blue hair. Don't know why I remember that. And there was a bit where they played Decode, and like the star of Decode was just uh, Jeremy Davis. Jeremy Davis. Yeah. Yeah. With just him going with like a grabber, and it's like yeah. I looked online, it's like a B7K, and I was like, that yeah. is the torn. Yeah. Wow. Honestly, a G3 with B7K, and it's an Ashdown rig he uses. Oh, uh, well. Like, excellent. It's funny you should say G3. Oh, yes. Because I also saw I also saw a G3 uh, oh, this dude. week. Tell us more. Um, a mysterious G3, I might add. <laughs> Uh, Mike Dernt has coming out, has a one-off, has... Mike Dernt has been seen with an Epiphone G3. 
several times now, and questions are being asked. Ugh. I saw it at the Green Day show. He played it pretty much non-stop for the first hour, maybe. I'm going to say an hour, because just for a bit of context, uh, when I went to see Green Day last week, they were doing all of Dookie in full and all of American Idiot in full. And I'd say they played for about two and a half hours with literally like no talking. It was just just non-stop. It was, it was amazing. Uh, they came out, they played The American Dream is Killing Me, which is like their latest single, and then just ripped straight into Dookie and did the whole of Dookie in order, not like in a different order, in in CD order, start to finish, with pretty much no stops, and Mike Dirt was playing this mysterious black G3, and it wasn't the custom bass that's recently appeared from is it bard guitars they're called yeah, Beard guitars yeah i saw that. that and i thought that was weird because i was like he's just yeah. got this new epiphone yeah he's got this from that what what he was playing was the was the epiphone model yeah, because it, i saw like... <laughs> i saw the epiphone logo on the headstock several times yeah and it's been rumored online you know it's yeah pro- people have noticed it and put it on forums and stuff that i've seen mm. um and i've heard rumors through because of that that we're going to be getting a signature model um and it's a really cool it's silver burst isn't it yes yeah but when in the when the light's not on it it kind of just looks black yes. but um i really hope it's coming out because it sounded so good well like uh, uh so this is what where there's a bit of not sure weirdness about okay. it okay um, because I've spoken to Gibson about this. I emailed them straight away and said, hey, what is going on? What A, what is going on? Is it real that I've heard and be, seen on stage? C- and can I demo one, please? Yeah. <laughs> because it's one of my all-time favorite bases. Be brilliant. All-time favorite bands. It's Green yeah. Day. It's Green Day. If you're, under the age of, if you're under the age of like 40, Green Day are amazing. End of. Yeah, absolutely. And... I would love to play one of these because it would just sound amazing. And they shot me down, not for not having one, but for um, saying, well, news news to me. Mm, no, no, don't, uh, no, haven't heard of that. And I don't know what to think about that because... I, mm, I think you've been told a porcupine there. I think so. Well, I'm leading I think, to that. Because... I think you've been told, like, we're not we're not announcing it yet, so we're just going to uh, pretend it doesn't exist. To... Yeah, They're now, playing the hype game. Come on. Now, let me tell you, I know there is things coming out from Epiphone that I won't yes. talk about. There are I, also, coming I out. also know there are things coming out from Epiphone that I've been told I can't talk about, and I think we're yeah. talking about the same thing. If yes. so, that's cool too. Very cool. Not quite as cool. As no, that would be what, a, what an absolute no brainer, you know, like for, for him to do a signature with Epiphone affordable level of a, of a base we haven't seen for years in production. Like, oh, my God, it's, it is printing money, this base. It is. And but for it to be sat there doing nothing is a crime. It is. But it depends how much it depends how much they sell it for, because it, it could be. We're getting a Mike Dunt G3. Oh my God, this is amazing. £1,300. Yeah, like 12 1300 £700 would, would be the mark. Price like, it the same as the Pete Wentz Sterling. It's the and same just, fan just, base. It's the yeah, same. Exactly. And then Gibson, shut your goddamn mouth. You haven't done anything right for 15 years as a company. Just shut up <laughs> and just let the money come in. And then, in about 12 months, do a Gibson one for the people yeah. who are really into it. Charge two, three grand or whatever, and they'll buy it too. Because they'll... if Mike Dunch is your favorite bass player and you've been gagging for a good G3, that sounds like a euphemism, but you'll buy it. Like, I want I want one. Like, I genuinely, I don't want to be like, oh, can you sort me out of a deal? I'm like, I'll, I'll call PMT, I'll ring up Anderton's, I'll just buy one. I want one. When they played using my team, affiliate link, <laughs> using Please. your affiliate link, of course. I really love how the autofocus really was like using my affiliate link. Then, like you <laughs> right there, give me some money, um, please. Uh, but yeah, when they played, when they played, um, when they played Longview, it was the, the bass just sounded fantastic. Mm. After they got Dookie out of the way, 
Um, he did move on to playing just various incarnations of his signature P-Bass, especially as they moved into... Um, they played a couple of songs off the new album, uh, and then like things like Brain Stew and Know Your Enemy. And then as they were finishing Brain Stew, the, uh, a giant inflatable of like the American Idiot Fist came up in the background. Cool. And everyone was just like, oh my God. And then they just went... Da, 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 and then did... Or fire constantly. Yeah. A lot of money got put into that show. But then, yeah, nice. in terms of the bass departments, a lot of just like my don't signature P basses. It was just like he had like a white one, had a red one. I think he had a black one as well. Just kind of rotating through those for the rest of the set. I imagine. Would there be? Is there a tuning change as well? Yeah, because Dookie's in E flat, I think. And then uh, a lot of the stuff is now in standard tuning, if I remember correctly. So I imagine that was probably why. Yeah. But. um yeah, so good. Sounded so good. They were amazing. Like, none of them have aged. I refuse to believe it. The fact that they're all <laughs> in their early 50s is mental. Trey yeah. Cool has still got it, by the way. He, yeah. like, rips. Rips Someone with a that, drum kit. with that name, like, you, exactly. you're a legend forever, you know, and you'll never lose it. Exactly. Trey Cool has a song on the end of Dookie called All By Myself, um, where it's, like, basically a, like, a silly little song about, just like, basically perfect on someone um and oh, he no. did it like he came on and they'd done like an orchestral rearrangement so there's all these like cellos playing and he it's only like one and a half minutes long it's just like a funny thing at the end of the album and he came on in like a leopard print smoking jacket and was like <laughs> skipping around the stage singing this song and then he finished it he sat back down the drum kit and then um did the drum beat for Know Your Enemy, you know, the da, da, dagger, dagger, like a, da, like a da, bat. yeah. And it was, it was, they were fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm very A big 10 out of 10. Them. I didn't even know they were in the country playing. I would nothing really? but these as well. Yeah, I didn't see Yeah, nothing but these were that. opening. Yeah, I think they're only yeah. doing like, I think they did Northern Ireland and then, yeah, I think they did Belfast and then like Manchester and London. Ah, but this is old. Yeah, this is Old Trafford Cricket Ground, which is like massive outdoor venue in Manchester. Yeah. Like, I've I've never been there before. The Foo, Foo Fighters played there the week before. They did like two nights there. Yeah, but um, yeah, interesting venue. Uh, not my favorite. Yes. Not my favorite Manchester venue. Yeah. Um, not the loudest PA in the world. Well, I shall Just... report back on Foo Fighters next week. Uh, oh, next time, I'm, are you I'm going to that this Tuesday? Yeah, lovely. You can. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can report back and give me uh, a nice little breakdown on that. Indeed, I shall. Shall we go through some some quick questions? I think we should, because uh, we've spoken about bases a lot. <laughs> Hilariously, for a base podcast, we've spoken about bass quite a lot today. So, Ridiculous. <laughs> I'm going to do... Yeah, I'm going to do it in that order. So, I've got a question for you, Johnny. Uh, what mm. do you think defines your sound? Oh my god! Uh, Tough bad one, playing. Isn't it? Okay, bad, bad playing. playing. Check. Yep. What else? Uh, <laughs> no bass, just all treble. That's it. Yep. No. Right. Yeah. Uh, Man plays so, ukulele. Yes. So, in all seriousness, uh, I think what my playing, <laughs> I, I play hard. Um, I've been trying to play softer recently with especially with finger style um bits but like with a pick I, i'm just, I'm, sl- I'm absolutely slamming that sucker um yeah and are. so uh i like it mm. to be compressed but so it's punchy but not too much um naturally gravitate towards a bit of a mid scoop um, with uh, bass and travel boosted ever so slightly, I would say uh, a clanky fatness, a clanky driven fatness. That's what I would say. Very well. That's my, okay. Um, I like a you know, a, 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 but all of this, I would say not too modern. With all of that, I don't like it to be like full active bass and like loads of weird EQing going on and super tinny and uh and poking through that way i still want it to have that <laughs> fat bottom roundness from like a p base or something like mm-hmm. that uh like a like a passive vintage style base you know with drive and preamps that's my kind of go-to so like a yeah i always app, SVT, yeah i think i always i always view you as like your bass tone i always view as kind of like 
aggressive vintage. Yeah. It's kind of like lots you 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 always when I think of you, I always think like quite bright, lots of drive, very much associate you as a pick guy, despite the fact that, you know, I see you play pick and fingers and slap all the time, but I always think, oh, he's a pick guy. Nice. Um but it's not like a modern distortion. Like a lot of this distortion stuff I always watch you do or like I always think about you is like full range. Like you're not doing like crossovers, distortions, or you're not going for like that you know, that modern clangy distortion where the distorted part sounds like a guitar amp. You know, it's it's not that. It is bass guitar. Yeah. But it's just a, a aggressively vintage. This yeah. is an interesting question for me. Because I don't think I have a sound personally. <gasps> Ooh, is this this is like a therapy session we need to dive Ooh, into? Maybe. Maybe just have a cry. So it all started when my dad No I'm kidding. <laughs> um No, I think it's because I like I cover so much ground in my bass playing because I just, just have to. That's my job. So and also I find myself like I'm very re- this will sound weird. I never feel like I'm me when I'm playing. I mean, I do obviously. I'm not. It's not. It's not. It's not like a weird out of body experience. But I'm always thinking it's like me trying to do this kind mm. of thing. Interesting. And there's negatives to that because it means like sometimes quite a lot. Of, well, quite a lot of the time, it doesn't feel genuine because it's like, well, I'm playing a part. Like I'm today. I'm being this guy, and I've done that. With every bass thing. Every, and I really do mean every bass thing. It's like wedding stuff, if it's like a, a chilled out band and I'm, I've got I've got flats on, I'm doing that, I'm like, okay, today we're trying to be Pino or we're trying to be... That's, I'm trying to... Oh, my God. What do you I'm think I said? said? I thought you said something else then, not Pino. No, no, tell the nice people what you what you thought I said. Uh, I thought... I thought you said I'm trying to be pedo, and I was like, "Whoa, wow, yeah, wow!" If if I had tea in my mouth, I would have spat it out. I thought I thought you were going to say I'm trying to be penis, but um, no, okay, no, that's even more of a stretch. Wow, okay, I'm trying to emulate the bass playing of Pino Palladino. <laughs> just to, <laughs> just to clarify, okay. <laughs> wow, um, I'm trying to do that, like trying to do Pino Palladino or. Like James Jameson, Carol K, like these big stop laughing. All these like <laughs> these like slip that in. Yeah, steady. Um yeah. or these uh you know, these kind of flat wound like Sean Hurley who plays bass for John Mayer now, big session guy, those kind of things. Or when it's like the rock thing, it's oh it's more of a rocky wed and it's like I'm trying to go for that kind of Mike Dern, Mikey Shoes from Green Day, you know, that's kind of like more like aggressive pick thing and then even in like my own bands like you know things like Darla and stuff like that it's like with Darla it's like I'm trying to be like spirit box periphery kind of like very modern distortion sound you know crossovers all that sort of stuff I I just feel like I'm me wearing different hats and masks which is very which has positives and negatives but go on you go on because I feel like you're about to tell me you don't believe me well I'm enjoying this uh this base identity crisis that you're going through um Mm. I think that there's, you know, reason you should feel this, but I also don't think it's necessarily that much of a problem for you because in the role that you're doing in your um, in wedding stuff, you, you're being a chameleon and yeah. you're wearing your references on your sleeve here. And that's, you know, what when we spoke to Ian Martin Allison, that's what he was saying mm. when he only understood those type of references and the, done the research and knows uh, the players that played the originals mm-hmm. was he able to grow as a player and to, and as a session guy, know what you're doing in those situations. I think when you need to be you is when you're contribu- you know, when someone's hiring you to do something for originals yeah. or they're hiring you um, for your sound or for the thing that you mm-hmm. bring. Whereas for the stuff that you're playing right now, majority of stuff is they're hiring you because you're replicating those songs and you are good at it. Yeah, but even if someone hired me in for an originals band, I'm still thinking about um, bass players that live in the genre. Like, Mm -hmm. so for example, um, 
I've just started doing work with another band. I won't say who because they don't really. I don't really know if they want to like you know publicly make it a thing yet. I'm just depping for some shows because they're between bass players, um, and they're a very muse queens of the stone age like a bit progressive a bit stone or rock a bit kind of thing like you know that's the niche the market sorry and i think of them and immediately go right well it's not the ding wall it's not the modern distortion i need to be looking at fuzzes inside the quad cortex i need that kind of sound i need to bring the p bass you know all these kind of things that to me doesn't feel like me it's like i am grabbing characteristics of other bass players and going well what does chris from muse do well he does this kind of sound okay how can i grab these bits for what they want and then um i'm in talks where i might be tracking bass on on an album for another band soon um Mm. the style of music they play in is like a lot more modern like like modern modern heavy music so i'm like right okay well that's the ding wall that's this but again these don't feel like me like I know I'm playing it, and and that is a contribution to the sound because I don't sound like Nolly. Like I don't sound like Mikey Shoes from from uh, periphery. Mikey Shoes from periphery. I don't <laughs> sound like Mikey wow. Shoes from uh, from Queens of Stone Age. I I'm me. I sound like me. That's what I sound like. But I'm I'm not thinking about it as me. I'm thinking yeah. about it as what can I cherry pick from these other people and blend it in with me to make it work. And yeah, sometimes I think that's a bad thing. But you're bringing along the best elements of, you know, what's going to fit this genre and sound, you know. So it's not always a negative necessarily that you're able to bring in all these references and go, well, I know I know how to achieve this kind of sound yeah. and what I need to do because I know things that are similar. Um, whereas someone might just go, yeah, I'm just going to, I'm just going to plug this, p base straight into this amp and done you know for something so yeah at least you're above kind of that level of ability and knowledge Mm. it's great um i suppose the recommendation if anyone else is feeling kind of like that like they don't have their own sound or they're not you know not able to go right well i know know, that's what i sound like yeah you know say say i've got this pedal here and i'm like oh well i know how to get the sound that i do out of this because i will boost this cut that bam that's what i like yeah Uh, um, to give you your kind of sound, I would recommend writing more. Mm, um, that's a very you know, good point. But even that because... doesn't work for me, though. That doesn't work for me because I go, well, what am I writing? And then if I write like a, a heavy riff, I go, right, okay, time to put the progressive metal hat on. And then I start thinking like those kind of bass players. But then again, it's like I'm painting this as a bad thing. This is like a really good thing because it shows like, insane levels of versatility in my opinion like i know people who do what i do where they just they just play as them and sometimes it works but i've i've seen your content i've 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 seen your shows and it's like it's just you you're not thinking about what we're covering like if we're covering sledgehammer by by what's his name wow forgot that peter gabriel oh god i forgot oh no if we (laughs) shit if we're doing sledge oh oh dear if we're doing sledgehammer i need you to sound like tony levin if you're not gonna try and sound like tony levin i'm not saying you need to bring a fretless but i need an octave pedal i i I need that (laughs) such an important part of that sound or at very least trying to get that sort of slidey sound with the pick attack and all the stops in the bass line to sledgehammer like yeah you need to be doing that you can't be like like you know johnny you can't play it like well, you could do, but I won't recommend it. If you were doing a wedding gig and you went, well, I'm going to play it like me, so I'm going to put the triple shot on. <laughs> um, I've got the big booty Judy. I'm going to put that on. Uh, and I'm going to get a jazz bass, nice and bright, and I'm going to hammer it with a pick. That will sound cool, don't get me wrong, but for the gigs I play, I wouldn't recommend you do that. No, Because they, they, exactly. want, they want Tony Levin right now. They don't want you. Yeah. And that's what I mean. It's the difference between what people want you for. It's like, we want you to be this chameleon that can do the thing you're here to do and understand that uh, rather than hiring you for you because we know you can get this sound. You know, it's it's very different skill sets in a way, you know. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate in a way that the bands I'm playing in at the minute is all that. <laughs> and I can be myself a little bit. And we're not so strict to be like, 
tone hunting to get it exactly bang on like w- like i know my tones especially with the um Foo fight stuff is a little more aggressively tone wise than it is on the record but the guys have said to me they'd be like you did it fuck it like if if one of the guitars said if it sounds good it sounds good Don't if it sounds good it like, is good that is yeah, the that yeah. is the phrase yeah no i totally agree i totally agree because it's like if you were in like a you know no super serious is the wrong word because that implies you aren't but like a know, hard yeah, like, co- like a hardcore Foo Fighters tribute band would literally be like levels. Yeah, they'd be like, "Don't you dare show up with anything other than an Ashdown amp and an uh, a, and, and an Nate Mendel, Mendel P, P yeah. bass and like whatever drives he uses." Because like we want that, and there are tribute bands out there who are, like super lock in, you know, like like. And I understand that, like if you were touring like theaters and really big venues, it's almost like a well, I want the closest to the real thing as humanly possible. That's one thing, but. If that's not what is, if that's not the goal of like your tribute band, then just don't bother. Yeah, we save yourself you the know, time and the like money. A, we're not dressing up. We're not doing that kind of thing. It's it's more like we're just covering them, you know, in a way. Uh, yeah, exactly. Because but... it's like it. Because then you get to the point where it's like the singer has to look exactly like Dave Grohl and all that sort yeah. of stuff, and it's like that's like hardcore levels. Like I've seen yeah. someone showed me an Elvis tribute band the other day who they knew, and the guy's in his forties, and he. He, I was, I was almost scared. Like the guy looked exactly, yeah, exactly the same as like, like peak Elvis. So not like the white spandex suits and the Vegas stuff from like just before he died and he got really overweight. We're talking like the the peak of like the movie Elvis, and it was like right. scurry. The resemblance wow. was like, re- I was like, he's had work done. I think he's had a little <laughs> bit, you know, like to kind of get the eyes right and stuff, but like. But he makes he makes hundreds of thousands a year because it's like and tours internationally and all that. But yeah. that's like a whole new level. Like there, you reach the point where it's like you're trying to actually be the person full time, and that's a bit scary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, good question. Good question. Very good I think, question. You know, um, it's difficult to define. It's always a journey. I think that, but there are fundamentals that we each have in our kind of sounds that we want to achieve and, and things we you know, rules that we always want to get and uh yeah i think that uh it's almost exciting sometimes when that changes particularly from a gear point of view when you're like oh well, i want to get this now it's just it's never ending you know mm. so fun 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 well we've got one more let's go one more question and this is a bit of a I feel like this is a debate point I feel like we're bringing back the big base debate because I feel like we'll both have polarizing opinions yeah. on this so this is this is a question someone brought in but it's almost like a debate point at the same time so the question was when it comes to five string bases oh. is there any point doing anything other than the multi-scale route now uh what because we have i think we have two different points on this yeah yeah i think we do because Mm. all right do do you want to go first then yes as a multi-scale base five string owner yes i think the multi-scale part of my ding wall makes it better than any other five string bass i have ever played ever caveat does that mean my ding wall is better than any other five string ever no, because it has got, you know, it's got positives and negatives. You know, it doesn't sound like a Spectre, you know, th- those kind of things. But the clarity, mid-range, and string tension that the multi-scale section allows for, I think, for me, means I'm not interested in owning pretty much any other five string unless mm. it has like that bit too like the abassi stuff is very interesting um a little bit of me still wants like a headless ibanez for a laugh a little bit but for me i i haven't i there's also lots of big five strings i haven't played like the big hitters but i've not played five string that compared to my ding wall that makes me go oh my god like listen to the that like the e flat the d the C sharp, the C, and the open B, or well, down to an open A for for Dala, for example. 
nothing comes close, in my opinion, when it comes to that bit. Pickups are a different story. Looks are a different story. Just the neck and the string tension. Yes. And that is, for those that don't know, an extended scale. You know, standard scale is 34 inch, short scale is 30 inch, medium, etc. So anything beyond 34 is an extended scale. So you will often get bases that, or some five strings will be 35 inch scales, but every string is 35. Every every string is a uniform distance between the the top nut and the bridge. The difference between, uh, you know, a, a multi-scale bass is that each string has a slightly different scale length. As is, you know, you'll see the yeah. frets are kind of fanned as they go up. And uh, all wonky looking. Yeah, and that's because it eventually kind of meets up with the nut at the top, which is slightly different. And that is to give you regular kind of tension on the E string and then a tighter tension uh, to compensate yeah. for that really low tuning that you're having and also, to and also it's And also it's for the higher register strings as well because a lot of complaints people have over uh, uniform scale length bases that are kind of like 35 inches, sometimes even like 35.5 is those D and, those, uh, D and G strings go um, a bit too kind of like zingy or yeah, a little too, bit too, too tight. Uh, the 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 too long and and also the, so the just to clarify it's like a piano if you look at a piano the bass strings that are on the left hand are, are longer and the reason why they're longer is as you go lower in pitch extending that that length allows for better tension which leads to things like arguably better intonation um, I find it brings out a lot more mid range and fundamental in the string you kind of get a really nice um, you get a nice even sound across all the strings. Because I find it when you play a five string sometimes, the E, the A, the D, and the G all sound a certain way, and they sound great. And then you hit that low B, and it's way louder, but a lot like, just a lot like fatter in terms of I've lost the notes, I now just have this huge subby sound, which still yeah. sounds great, but the advantage of like, like my Dingwall, for example... The the E you would fret on the fifth fret of the B string sounds the same as the open E string. It's very and that's, uniform. That's big because a lot of basses will be too boomy on the lower yeah, string. Clever exactly. Sounds and this doesn't, And this doesn't have that. And similarly, you have a problem as you get to the higher strings. So the higher strings on these long scale basses that aren't fan frets is the higher strings lose lose a lot of low end and mm. end up sounding almost like guitar strings i think is yeah. what people describe them as whereas right. my dingwall the g string is 34 inches just the same as a, a, as a plain old normal bass and then as we go up through the strings and well lower in pitch we end up getting further and further and further to the point where the low b is a is 37 inches and that just like i said gives just in my opinion like a lot more clarity and a lot more it just it just sounds better. Like even just the DIs and stuff sounds. I just think sounds pristine and and usable and nice and uniform. That's like how I would describe it. Consistency across the fretboard is the key there. I think and that's with the that big kind thing. of style yeah. of music. You might be doing more of that. Um, I think what this mistakenly does this this kind of question is that you know that is a that's a specific thing it's a good tool and a good yeah. feature yeah. that helps combat something when you're tuning low that's why you see loads of metal guys you know dingwall we all know is actually a very very versatile instrument but the very majority of people alarmingly players, so yeah a lot of yeah. people think it's just like a you i only need it if i'm playing like metal songs or like you know i'm tuning down to drop g and further yeah. and all that sort of stuff and and that's not true it's an, it's a fantastic instrument just in standard tuning as a regular that's why. passive as a regular standard tuned bass but that's why we see lots of metal players doing it because they're tuning low and it was the best instrument to do that with or that yeah. kind of bass and so i think it, it really kind of i think it really is like i only go down to drop a you know you can yeah. go so much further but for me tune down to to a with the 130 gauge b string uh, just it's that sounds the best in my opinion yeah. 
And when you're hitting it hard for that genre of music, naturally you want it to be tighter. Up to exactly, up to it holds it, it stays in tune. You don't yeah. have the thing where you hit it and you hear it go sharp, flat, and then back up to concert pitch. It's just, so, it's just solid. There is a big difference between um, uh, a 34 and a 35, even when you feel it. Um, yeah. So if it were my choice of getting a five string that's going to be the one <laughs> or like a custom five string or something like that, I, well, I'm torn really, but I would opt for a 35 because it's mm. kind of the best of both in a way that you're well, getting yeah, you that get slightly that tighter, but it's not going to be too bad on the other strings. Every 35 I've played has been fine for me in terms of the other strings. Um, I think, yeah, what this question does is say that, well, everyone's going to want the multi-scale thing. Well, a lot of people don't get on with the multi-scale thing. Uh, it takes, I think it takes a little bit of yeah. getting used to. Um, I've only played a handful. And every time I've gone, oh, this is weird. And then you move into it. But some people don't. And some people don't want that. And aesthetically is a big thing as well. Some people just don't oh, like it. Yeah, the aesthetic is a big thing. Like I've had loads of people where... <laughs> I've had I've had people where I've I've needed to bring a five string to a gig and it's not really a ding wall gig, and like I've spoken just briefly to like the people in the band and gone, oh, if you need a five string, I'm gonna have to bring this, and they've been all like, what is that? That is like the ugliest bass I've ever seen. Don't bring that. That looks what? stupid. You know all that kind of thing. And I've gone, look, it's only let me bring it to re- let me bring it to rehearsal, and then just tell me what you think. And then I've brought it. Like once I brought it accidentally because I opened my gig bag and thought, oh, put the wrong bass in the wrong gig bag and, and, and not checked. And, you know, we've got a few songs into rehearsal and people have gone, that's the best sounding bass I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. Like, like, as in like, oh my God, like it just sounds huge because of the, just the clarity of what it, of, of how it kicks out the notes. But the aesthetic yeah. thing's like a massive thing. Like a lot of people look at it and just go, like i'm not in periphery like i don't want to i don't want to look like that yeah which is why um, i do a thing called the super p and you should just get that instead ding 100%, 100%. Uh, periphery also don't use a dick wall so what it is well the bass player does what do you mean no, no, no. what do you mean no but oh periphery sorry i thought yeah. <laughs> i was thinking of polyphia i was like ah. you spoke about it earlier you idiot <laughs> i was like you do understand that the ng in uh, the word uh, ng2 stands for nolly get good the, the bass player well i don't he's kind of not in periphery anymore but like the bass player of periphery i think he still plays on the album or have i got that wrong now i don't really know it's, you know well i know he doesn't talk it's, it's probably just his plug-in <laughs> Well, yeah, they probably re- they've also probably replaced him with MIDI now. But uh, um, like, I know he doesn't tour. I know they don't tour with a bass player anymore. Yeah, shame. Um, going back to the five strings, I want to talk yes. about this one for a minute that I've got currently in my collection, Ooh, which is what a are court, you? a court Elric Five. One thing to look for if you're if you want, you know, you don't want a longer scale bass, but you want uh, that nicer sounding B is a zero fret on a five very oh. nice good feature to have uh it kind of makes the open sound like a fretted note so it's not too boomy and uh yeah sounds a bit tighter nice nice i see very nice um, very informative yes uh and if you're playing light or you know jazzy stuff perhaps uh a, a, not a extended range bass i don't think i don't think it's necessary really um you can certainly it, you know it all depends on what you're playing i think i want to move on quickly to talk about matt parker's short string uh a short string god short <laughs> scale. i was like what's the word what, what, what what's a short what's a short what's a short Sh- five scale sean, short sean string. connery <laughs> yeah uh, i want to talk about uh it's matt parker's short scale five string which you that's know, the one s- sounds ridiculous when you're like oh, like really the tension's gonna be super floppy yeah. for that low five string B. short scale with flats, am I right? No, it's uh, no, it's not flats. Okay, it? okay, cool. uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's built to purposely sound dark for the music that he was playing. Yeah, oh man, the mid range on that bass sounds impeccable. It's a really, really nice. I've done a uh, borrowed it for a couple of weeks and did a little demo on Instagram of it. And yeah, I fell in love with that. Uh, the feeling of it was amazing. Uh, I just found I didn't find myself doing metal or like anything fast on there. And it's not built for that, really. Um, 
well uh, it was built for aggressive music but the thing he wanted to achieve was not the clanky clanky dingwall sound um and it just had its own um soul it felt like like it really felt like it was serving this purpose and it just felt and sounded great and um yeah and and a different kind of playing that it kind of lent itself to i found when i was playing it anyway so i think that there's no rules <laughs> don't uh trick yourself into thinking that oh yes i must have 35 inch um because there you might play something that will surprise you um but at the end of the day they're all tools for what absolutely you need. absolutely i think at the end of the day also you you need to go and find what works for you like mm. I really think the extended range thing works for me, mm. but I I haven't played Matt's bass. Like I could play Matt's bass and go, "Oh my god, this is amazing!" Like this is yeah. this is forget that this is perfect. Yeah, for me, I want a short scale yeah. five string now. Oh, interesting. For me, it's like you know, I get people asking, you know, like, "Can you record something for me? I need the ding wall thing." And I'm like, "Well, I've got a ding wall, so yes." Um, the ding thing. People want that the, the D thing. People want the D, Johnny. Um, <laughs> but uh, you've got to try things that work for you because, as you said, some people just can't get over the looks, or yeah. they just can't get over like you know, like you, your hand does move a little bit differently. And the only disadvantage I'd say of like the multi scale thing is past the twelfth fret on like the A, D, uh, and G strings, it, 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 the frets are now moving the other way. So yeah. they're kind of mo- almost moving right to left in a tiny bit. And if you're not used to that, it's quite weird. Mm. I'm used to it now because like I've 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 had a ding more for a couple of like two years, maybe, something like that now. So I'm I'm very used to it. But first timers might go, Oh, this feels weird. And also like if you're playing lots of metal stuff <laughs> and you're going from like the first fret to the sixth fret, you know, on that law thing, you are you are travelling three inches more than a normal bass. Like you are you, yeah. you can't really be a positional player sometimes. You have to just get well, used to the fact that I'm about to make like an eight fret slide and I have to practice accordingly to to do this big movement. Yeah. But once you get that once you get that kind of nailed in, like I've got nailed in, I'm very comfortable with it now. <laughs> Cause I know, well, the first fret feels like it's about here, and I know the sixth fret's there. It's like, okay, yeah. I can do that. That's just fine. developing that muscle memory, isn't yeah. It? But you've got to get used to you've got to you've got to get used to that first before you go out and gig it. And if you're not willing to put that time in, and by time, I really do mean like a few hours at the most. Yeah. Like it's not like a several weeks thing. I I got used to the ding wall thing in like a, a, an hour or two, and I was like, oh okay, right, feels okay now. But you've got to do that if you're not willing to do that. And also, it's set that if you jump back to another base the day after, it will feel really weird to you. If you're not willing to do that. Might not be right for you. Might not be the one. And there's no. lots to choose from. So choose wisely. <laughs> um, thank you so much, everyone, to sending in your questions this week. Uh, let us know um, what you thought about this episode in the comments down below or reach out to us on Instagram. We love seeing you share it on your stories and stuff to share the good news to other people. That's how we grow <laughs> and get to more people. So please, please yeah. uh, do just that. Uh, the other thing we want you to do is rate this podcast five stars on your listening platform of choice. It helps something to do with algorithms to get it to more people, more people, bigger guests, bigger pod bigger boys um so yeah please do all of those things um chris where can people find you on the internet nice and simple you can find me everywhere under that guy on base johnny where can everyone find you spectacular similarly i am johnny dibble uh, in most places on tiktok I am Johnny Dibble Bass, but mainly hanging out over on Instagram and YouTube. Ah, wonderful. Um, Thank you, everyone, so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Ta-ta. Ta-ta.